The first step in creating the finished natural product from its raw elements is extraction. Industrial raw materials go through a lengthy process of extraction and transformation. This is done with specialized machinery. They oversee the mining process, transport, storage, and any subsequent processing that may be required, such as crushing, screening, or grinding. In this video, we will be examining 20 technologies for the extraction of raw materials. Number 20. How gasoline is made from crude oil. Crude oil undergoes the first stage of refining by being heated in a furnace until it vaporizes into a gas. To further separate the liquids and vapors, they are sent via an air distillation tower which uses the varying boiling points of the components to create distinctive streams or fractions. Liquids are gathered at the base of the tower from the heavier streams which have higher boiling points. At the same time, gasoline vapors, naphtha and kerosene which boil and condense at lower temperatures are collected as a gas at the tower's peak. Parts of the distillation tower that produce components with intermediate boiling points, such as diesel and medium weight gas oil, are collected and removed. Yes, this is how gasoline is made from crude oil. Now it is possible to collect and transport some of these streams straight to markets, such as liquefied petroleum gas or jet fuel created from kerosene. Some of them need to be processed further. Light streams, like lower octane naphtha, can be converted into gasoline with a slight chemical modification using a reformer. To produce lighter, more valuable molecules like gasoline and diesel, cracking units use heat, pressure, and catalysts for massive heavy molecules. Similar molecules can be joined together to form larger ones via alkylation units. Petroleum coke is a product of the coking process, which uses high temperatures and pressures to break down the molecules in the heaviest streams into smaller ones. Butanes, naphtha, diesel, and petroleum coke are all byproducts of a coking unit. Number 19. Technology extracts more gold from ore. Gold is a highly sought-after metal around the globe. It is utilized in jewelry, electronics, and even space travel because of its malleability, conductivity, and corrosion resistance. However, conventional gold processing frequently makes use of cyanide, a well-known poison that has been outlawed for commercial use in a number of nations. The search for a scalable, non-toxic alternative to cyanide in gold extraction from ore may finally be over, according to the work of a team of researchers from Finland's Aalto University. The findings have been reported in chemical engineering. When mining for gold, the ore is typically crushed into a powder and then leached in a series of tanks. After that, cyanide is employed to dissolve the gold in the leached solution. Table salt contains two elements. Chloride is one of them, and it is used in the new process of leaching and recovery procedure. Our method has resulted in a chloride recovery of as much as 84% of the gold initially present in the ore. Our control trial utilizing the conventional cyanide method with the same ore only produced a 64% yield. The new method, Electrodisposition Redox Replacement, or EDRR, takes the best features of two existing techniques for extracting leached gold and combines them into a single, more efficient procedure, electrolysis, in which electric currents are used to reduce gold present in the leaching solution, and cementation, in which particles of other metals are added to the solution to react with the gold. Did you you know this was how gold was made? Let us know in the comments section if you are a clever clogs. Make sure to also like this video and subscribe to the channel for more videos like ours which I hope you'll agree are just as valuable as gold. Number 18. How fish oil is extracted. Wet pressing is the most frequent process used to extract fish oil for mass production. This technique is widely used by industries because it yields high quality fish oil. Wet pressing entails the following procedures. When raw fish is processed, it is first chopped up or hashed and then steamed. Oil and water are extracted from the cooked fish while the fat-free dried particles are squeezed out. Both the particles and the liquid are processed further to extract the oil and water, respectively, from 
the fish. The solids from the separated water are reintroduced to the fish meal. During refining, impurities in the oil are eliminated using high temperatures of water. And in the final stage of the fish oil extraction process, antioxidants are added to the oil before it is packaged. Fish is typically steamed for oil extraction, although this method increases the likelihood that contaminants will remain in the final product. If you need pure oil quickly, centrifugation is the preferable option over waiting for the particulates to separate from the oil and water, which takes time and is inefficient. Number 17. How Essential Oils Are Extracted From Plants Essential oils are extracted from plants using solvents that are safe for human consumption, such as hexane and ethanol. It works well with resinous or otherwise tough plant materials that produce little essential oil, as well as with more sensitive aromatics that would be damaged by the heat and pressure of steam distillation. This process also wields a more refined aroma than any distillation technique. Wax and pigment are examples of non-volatile plant materials that are extracted and sometimes eliminated during this process. As the plant matter reacts with the solvent, it yields a waxy, aromatic substance known as concrete. This concrete substance's oil particles are released upon contact with alcohol. The oil is subsequently employed in perfumes by the perfume business or in aromatherapy, and the aforementioned chemicals used in the process stay in the oil. Supercritical CO2 extracted essential oils from herbs have the same applications as distilled essential oils, including aromatherapy and natural perfumery. Steam distillation yields oils of varying quality depending on the conditions of heat, pressure, and duration. Therefore, unlike the steam distillation procedure, the CO2 extraction method may result in oils of superior quality because they are not degraded by high temperatures. None of the oil's components are harmed by the high temperatures used in CO2 extraction. Number 16. Extraction of Copper from Copper Ore Copper from its ore is the first step in a lengthy process that finally yields cathodes, which are sheets of 99.99% pure copper that will be incorporated into a wide variety of useful consumer goods. Copper oxide and copper sulfide, the two most common forms of ore, go through two distinct procedures, hydrometallurgy and pyrometallurgy, due to their distinct chemical compositions. Copper oxides are more common near the Earth's surface, however, this type of ore is not very valuable because of its low copper content, oxides can still be mined profitably despite the higher ore extraction and processing costs associated with this method. Copper sulfide ores, on the other hand, are not as common, but have a higher copper content. More copper can be recovered, but only at the expense of increased processing costs. The mining and shipping phases of processing copper ores are similar. In open pit mining for copper, a series of stepped benches are excavated gradually deeper into the earth to access the mineral deposit. Boring machines, no, I don't mean that they're boring, I mean, what they do is they are used to bore holes into the hard rock, and then explosives are placed in the holes to blast and crush the rock, revealing the ore below. After the blasting is complete, the resulting boulders are ready to be transported using specialized haul trucks, conveyors, railroads, or shuttle cars. Number 15. How Natural Latex Is Extracted From Rubber Trees Natural rubber is a type of polymer that is derived from plants. Some polymers occur in nature, while others are manufactured artificially. One of the most useful polymers in human history is natural rubber. Thousands upon thousands of manufactured goods rely on natural rubber as a crucial component. The latex from specific tree species is what is used to create natural rubber. There are about 2,500 different kinds of trees that yield this sap. But the heavier Brasiliensis tree, also known as the rubber tree, provides the vast bulk of the latex used to make tires. Although they originated in South America, these trees can now be found widely distributed throughout Southeast Asia. 
Rubber tapping is not destructive to forests because the tree is not cut down to get the latex. Old secondary forests, like that scene in the jungle, closely resemble the primary forests. About half as many species can be found here when compared to a true primary forest. Compared to the primary forest, with 171 tree species, 89 lianas, and 63 epiphytes, and the monoculture estates, jungle rubber sample sites have a total of 92 tree species, 97 lianas, and 28 epiphytes. About 137 bird species, compared to 241 in the primary forest, are supported by jungle rubber. According to estimates from professionals, the hydrological functions of jungle rubber are predicted to be similar to those of a primary forest. Compared to other crops like coffee, or even more so, oil palm, the environmental impact of monoculture rubber tree plantations is minimal. Number 14. Extraction of honey from hives. I love honey, but I'm not really too fond of sticking my hand into a hive to grab all that sweet stuff, because you know what's going to happen. Going to get stung to heck. But of course, there are much easier ways to extract honey safely. <laughs> Now, when honey is extracted, it is taken out of the frames of the beehive. An extractor is used to spin the uncapped frames in this process. The honey is taken from the combs and collected in a reservoir using centrifugal force. The honey must be warm enough to flow freely for this method to be effective. Thus, extraction should begin as soon as possible after the frames have been taken from the hives. A warm chamber should be used to store the frames before extraction. Although there is a wide range in size and technology employed by extractors, the underlying mechanical principles are very consistent. The smallest extractors are the manual two-frame variety, while the largest are fully automated 120-frame behemoths that can handle over 600 frames per hour. Honey harvesting from beehives is a primary motivation for keeping honeybees. Humans have been fascinated by honeybees and their ability to retain large amounts of this delectable stuff for thousands of years. Honey has its own unique flavor and perfume, since the bees collect nectar from different flowers. Number 13. Extraction of Cane Sugar Sugar, do 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 do. Okay, I'm not gonna sing all that, but I love some sugar, and I'm sure you do too. So this is how the sweet stuff is extracted. Sugar cane fields are commonly burnt as a first step in the manual harvest procedure. The cane is then stripped of its leaves before being cut to the ground by hand by a crew of farmers. However, this process takes days, and it is harmful to wildlife and reduces the quality of the sucrose in the cane because the leaves are burned. The burning of sugar cane in Thailand that has contributed to an increase in pollution has also been the subject of current debate. However, programs like VIVE have been seeking to collaborate with farmers to provide them with sugarcane harvester equipment to ensure a safer harvest, and as a result, less pollution in the process. Anyway, getting back on topic. The cane is loaded by hand onto trucks and then driven to the mill after being manually harvested. Sugarcane can also be harvested using a mechanized harvesting method in which a machine moves across the field, cutting and loading the cane as it goes. Cane harvesting machinery is considered the industry's future. This is due to the fact that transporting the cane to the mill is both more environmentally friendly and more cost-effective as well. Mechanized harvesting can cut the typical harvest period in half, from 48 hours to just 6 to 12 hours. Better harvest efficiency equals more money in the coffers of the farms thanks to increased sugar yields. So in short, harvesting machinery equals more money, more sugar cane extracted and less pollution. Now that is sweet. Number 12. Extracting rare earth elements from coal ash. Now let's get to talking about the technique of isolating individual rare earth elements. Molycorp in the United States, Rodien in France, and Santoku in Japan were among the earliest players in rare earth extraction, and they all manufacture rare earth products made from rare earth compounds, metals, and alloys. Chinese researchers discovered in the mid-1980s that rare earth found together with iron minerals is easier to harvest. Starting in the mid-1980s, China began mass-producing rare earth materials 
materials and products in accordance with meticulously mapped out five-year programs. There are costs connected with extracting, storing, and complying with regulations for rare earth mined from monazite because of the mineral's association with radioactive thorium. Thorium can be used in breeder reactors to create fissile U233 fuel. However, thorium-based nuclear reactors have not yet matured into a commercially viable technology for producing nuclear power on a massive scale. Therefore, countries that were harvesting rare earth from monazite were negatively impacted by the lack of thorium storage. Some monetized deposits, namely those with a high association of heavy rare earth, were shown to be more viable for commercial extraction than others. Scientific and technological progress has revealed that heavy rare earth allows for the attainment of special effects in a variety of different contexts. Number 11. How plastic is made from crude oil Natural resources, including cellulose, coal, natural gas, salt, and crude oil, are processed through a polymerization or polycondensation reaction to create plastics. Plastics are made from renewable resources, like the ones we just mentioned. Distilling crude oil in an oil refinery is the first step in the manufacturing of polymers. In this way, the dense crude oil is broken down into its lighter constituents or fractions. Hydrocarbon chains, which are chemical compounds composed of carbon and hydrogen, vary in length and molecular structure, and this variation is reflected in the composition of each fraction. Naphthala, one of these byproducts, is an essential ingredient in plastics manufacturing. In order to create plastics, two basic processes are used. Again, those are polymerization and polycondensation. Long polymer chains are created by linking together monomers in a polymerization reactor. Different polymers have different properties, structures, and sizes because they are constructed from different types of basic monomers. Number 10. Cornstarch made from corn. Here's a shocker of the century. Did you know cornstarch is made from corn? Yeah, it took me by surprise as well. But anyway, let's check out how this is made. This, now, this process involves about four steps. The first step is purging the corn of any and oil undesirable substances. The corn is cleaned, then soaked in water until it expands to twice its original size. The starch is released as the gluten bond weakens. The second step in the making of cornstarch is to finely mill the corn in order to separate the germ from the fiber gluten and starch. Two discs and two germ separation hydrocyclones are used in the two primary stages of this technique. The corn oil is extracted from the maize germ after it is washed, separated from the slurry, and dried. A fine mill is a type of mill that is used to grind maize kernels down to flour. Thus, all of the starch is eliminated while the fiber is retained in its coarse form. Now, techniques of starch extraction and counter-fiber washing are applied to the pumped grit milk, which contains both fine and coarse fiber. The fiber is then taken out of the system, extracted from the liquid, and dried. Next, gluten will be concentrated in the disc nozzle separator as the heavy phase, and then it will leave the device via the nozzles. The concentrated gluten is then decanted using a centrifugal decanter before being dried. After collecting the starch slurry, it is dewatered using a rotary drum filter or a peeler centrifuge. Drying equipment is now used to dry the dehydrated starch cake. And hey presto, you got cornstarch. Number 9. How iron ore is turned into steel. In order to function, blast furnaces need a large number of ancillary buildings. A large steel cylinder lined up with heat-resistant brick serves as the basic function of the furnace. Once a blast furnace is blown in, production continues until either the refactory lining wears out or iron demand drops below the minimum necessary to shut it down. A campaign is the time that it takes to run a furnace from start to end, which could be several years. The stack is the central part of a blast furnace where raw materials like iron ore, coke, and limestone are charged and gradually heated up as they fall to the bottom. The gas produced by burning coke is introduced to the upper section of the furnace where the iron ore is heated and the oxygen is driven off. About an intermediate distance down, slag is formed when limestone reacts with ore and coke impurities. The slag takes on the coke's ash as its own. Some of the carbon in the coke and the silica in the ore are both converted 
converted to silicon and dissolved into the iron. Molten slag stays on a pool of molten iron four or five feet deep at the bottom of the surface, where temperatures reach well over 3000 degrees Fahrenheit. The slag is easily removed from the top of the iron in the furnace by cutting a notch specifically for the slag. A tap hole in the furnace's hearth allows the molten iron to flow out. Additional materials can be charged at the top of the furnace due mostly to the tapping of iron and slag. Number 8. Extraction of Titanium the percentage of titanium in the Earth's crust places it at number 9 on the periodic table. It has the same volume as steel, but is 60% lighter, is corrosion resistant, and is very strong. Airplanes, spacecraft, missiles, and ships all make use of this metal because of its useful characteristics. Furthermore, it is widely used in the production of medical materials such as hip and knee prosthesis, bone screws, anti-trauma plaques, dental implants, heart valves, and pacemakers due to its biocompatible property as the tissues of the human body tolerate its presence. In addition, scalpels, scissors, and staplers are primarily made of this metal. However, its usage in certain sectors has been constrained by the high production costs of metallic titanium, but titanium's continued use is justified by its many benefits in aerospace and biological applications. Titanium is extremely rare in its metallic state in the wild. The minerals ilmenite and sand deposits containing rutile, anatase, leucoxine, and brookite are the primary concentrated sources of titanium. Number 7. Extraction of Bamboo Fiber Biodegradability and reduced environmental impact are just two of the many advantages of natural plant fiber composites, which have been created for use in manufacturing because of their environmental friendliness, mechanical qualities, and recyclability. Polymer composites made with bamboo fiber have gained a lot of interest as reinforcement material. The numerous methods have been developed to extract fibers from raw bamboo culm are categorized and described as mechanical extraction, chemical extraction, and a hybrid of the two are the three most common methods, thermal analysis techniques, and composites made from extracted bamboo fibers are also categorized and analyzed. Extraction methods, fiber length, fiber size, resin application, temperature, moisture content, and composite preparation processes are only some of the many factors that impact the mechanical attributes and composite features of bamboo fibers and bamboo composites. The microstructures of bamboo fibers is dramatically altered by steam explosion and steam extraction and chemical extraction procedures, making mechanical extraction the more environmentally preferred option. Matrix type, bamboo microstructure, and fiber extraction procedures are all factors that should be taken into account during the creation of bamboo fiber reinforced composites and interfacial adhesion manufacturing techniques. Number 6. How to extract cocoa butter from cocoa beans Time to start licking your lips because we're talking about cocoa beans, or more specifically, getting cocoa butter from cocoa beans. Now, cocoa butter, a rich fat pressed from cocoa beans, is used in several culinary, confectionery, and cosmetic applications. However, cocoa beans are notoriously challenging to prepare without high-end machinery. Products containing cocoa butter tend to be more expensive because of the difficulty of the extraction procedure. Nonetheless, cocoa butter's enduring popularity can can be attributed to its luscious feel, pleasant aroma, and unique taste. Yummy. Whole cocoa beans are processed to get the cocoa butter. The beans are fermented before being dried for use in chocolate production. Cocoa nibs are the unshelled roasted bean kernels that result from this process. Cocoa butter makes somewhere between 54 and 58% of cocoa nibs. Cocoa mass is created when cocoa nibs are pulverized into a finer consistency. This mass becomes a liquid called cocoa liqueur or chocolate liquor once heated over the melting point of cocoa butter. Cocoa butter and non-fat cocoa solids are extracted from chocolate liqueur through processing. Deodorizing cocoa butter is a common practice for getting rid of off flavors. Number 5. Extraction of caffeine from tea leaves 
Get your chef hats out, folks, because I'm going to be teaching you how you can extract pure caffeine from tea leaves. At room temperature, the tea is ready to be mixed with methylene chloride. After capping the tubes and shaking them for a few seconds, the pressure should be released by slowly unscrewing the lids. Shake the tubes for 30 seconds, venting the tube as needed. The extraction process is likely to result in the formation of an emulsion. Centrifuge the tubes for two to three minutes to break the emulsion. Ensure that the centrifuge is stable by placing tubes of about similar mass on the opposite end of the rotor. The mixture should separate into two distinct layers, the lower of which is practically colorless. The emulsion has not been completely removed if a third foamy greenish brown layer appears between the upper and lower layers. To avoid contaminating the flask with the dark aqueous layer, carefully remove the bottom organic layer using a plastic pipette. To repeat the extraction process, fill each tube with three milliliters of new methylene chloride, replace the caps, and shake the contents for 30 seconds. Be sure to let the air out of the centrifuge tube at regular intervals. Repeat the initial centrifuging process with the tubes. The first extract should be added to the flask after the organic layer at the bottom has been removed. Once more, avoid moving any of the murky water layers. And to eliminate any remaining moisture from the combined methylene chloride extracts, add anhydrous sodium sulfate. To prevent the crystals from clumping, add sodium sulfate using only the tips of little spatulas and let this concoction sit for 10 minutes. And hey presto, you got some caffeine right there, ready to drive your heart crazy. Number 4. How Marble is Extracted the first stage in extracting marble is finding a suitable quarrying site. Geologists have the best chance of finding a vein in an outcrop of marble. The quality of the marble slab, and hence the countertop, depends on the location of the cutter. A single crosscut, as opposed to one along the vein, will seem incredibly different. Synthetic diamond wire and diamond-tipped drills are used to split the rock onto a vertical plane, creating a bench wall, which is necessary for marble mining. First, holes are drilled into the marble from above the quarry, and then another hole is drilled from the side to line up with the first. A machine holds the wire under tension as it slides through the marble, and the stone is supplied through the holes. The usage of a chainsaw-like mechanism is common in quarries located deep within mountains. In order to repair chips and cracks in marble, resin is frequently used. After being polished, the resin coating will only cover a small percentage of the surface, preserving the natural look and stunning beauty of the finished stone. Although marble can be seen in many countries, some of the most well-known quarries are located in in Italy, Canada, Spain, India, China, and Germany. Most marbles, including Carrara, get their names from the quarries where they were initially discovered. Number 3. Extraction of Silk from Worm Cocoons the silkworm's transformation into a silk moth involves the production of silk fibers as it spins itself into a cocoon. Raw cocoons are heated in water, still holding the silkworms, until the cocoons unravel, revealing the ultra-soft fibers inside. The technique is labor-intensive and complicated, hence the finished garments or textiles are high in price. You can also find silk in things like medical equipment, bicycle tires, and more. Mulberry Lee is the food source for silkworms. The Cocoons are boiled or dried in the sun after collection to extract the silk fibers. The term reeling of the silk refers to the process of unraveling the cocoon and removing the silk fiber. Spinning the silk fiber to form yarn out of the silk strands is the next process. Silk fiber, obtained by unraveling the cocoons, is used to weave cloth. The cocoon is the silkworm's first and most vulnerable home. Silk threads produce a covering for the cocoon. Direct sunshine, boiling water, or steam is used to remove the strands from the cocoon. Number 2. Extraction of Oxygen and Nitrogen from Liquid Air Nitrogen is, as we all know, a ubiquitous element. It's found naturally in human bodies and accounts for 78% of Earth's atmosphere. Industrially prepared nitrogen is also commonly used in the chemical and industrial sectors. In order to use pure nitrogen, it must be extracted from the air. The diatomic form of nitrogen is common in the environment and makes up a large portion of the air we breathe. It can serve as a simple chemical synthesis-free source of nitrogen by subjecting air to various 
various forms of generation, nitrogen can be extracted from the atmosphere. So how then does one extract nitrogen from the air exactly? It involves using a technique called fractional distillation. Nitrogen may be extracted from liquid air as a result. When it is cooled, the nitrogen is isolated, and the mixture is separated from the air, and then finally collected. Liquid nitrogen may be recovered and harvested for use in manufacturing at just the right low temperatures. Once the gases have been converted to liquids, they can be stored and transported in cylinders and tanks. However, there are a few obstacles that may arise during nitrogen transportation. Corrosion and careless transportation of boilers between factories also pose potential dangers. Number 1. Aluminium Extraction and now it's time to talk about aluminium extraction, or if you're American, aluminum extraction. By applying a voltage, electrolytes can be oxidized into their component elements. For a particular electrolyte, one can anticipate the resulting electrolysis products. One metal for which this technique is used for oil extraction is aluminium. It is also expensive to obtain due to the enormous amount of energy required during the refining process. Bauxite is the name for aluminium oil. Aluminium is mined from bauxite by processing it into aluminium oxide, also known as aluminia, a white powder. Electrolysis is used for the extraction, however, aluminium oxide must be heated to allow current to flow. The high cost of melting aluminium oxide is due to its high melting point, around 2000 degrees Celsius. It is instead dissolved in liquid cryolite, since aluminium has a lower melting point than aluminium oxide. Using molten cryolite as a solvent, allows the ions in aluminium oxide to move freely at a lower temperature, cutting down on the amount of energy needed for extraction process. Was this video educational enough for you? Drop your comments in the comment section down below, and make sure to subscribe to this channel and hit the like button on the video as well. And please share it with anyone you think would like it. Anyway, this is Jake the Voice Pass signing off. Thank you very much for watching, and have a good one.